um, the, um, the, the kind of uh, feelings that might be behind give me money is the sense that somebody should be giving it to you, that your cause is really worthy, which it might be, um, but that there's a sense of obligation. Um, and usually, uh, I think in the um, sort of description of the talk, I use the example of you go out to a restaurant with friends and you forget your wallet. And you're like, oh gosh, I'm really in a situation where I do need you to hand me some and borrow it and I will pay you back. So there's this sense of it being um, sort of an awkward situation. Um, the second one focuses more on the cause um, and focuses more on sort of speaking to the motivation of people who feel good about giving to an organization, an open source project, a hackerspace, whatever the case may be. Um, and so we'll try to sort of break down what that looks like and what some of the steps are to um, help you kind of go through the process of doing a fundraising campaign where you'll be asking a lot of people, not just one person. Um, and I put that I'm both at EFF and at Giant Rabbit because most of what we'll be talking about is um, ways that we did sort of major giving, so a thousand and above at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which I just left about two weeks ago. So um, I thought I would just start out by saying that by the end, I hope that you go away feeling more um, confident asking for donations on behalf of whatever project it is that you're working with. Um, and that you kind of know what it looks like um, underneath the hood. So you may have had already experiences, which we'll talk about next, um, either giving to organizations or asking others to give to you. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of structure that you can sort of add to that process to make it um, something that is less random, um, uh, feels like a less traumatic because you're like, oh gosh, I don't know if anybody's going to give to me at the end of the day and I'll have to shut down my project, which can be a um, pretty, pretty emotional roller coaster. So um, I thought that the uh, schedule would just be to kind of break down four major steps um, in relation to fundraising in sort of 15 minute blocks and have just a discussion back and forth about um, what is the structure that I've used and found helpful? What have you experienced? Um, would you find this helpful? And I'll also point out that ask is the very last one. A lot of times people tend to focus on um, the ask or asking for money as the only component of fundraising. Um, and it's certainly one that has the most immediate outcome, but it's definitely not the most important. Um, and how you can try to change um, the ultimate outcome is actually by doing um, the first three steps better. And then we'll troubleshoot at the end because there'll be pretty predictable um, problems that you'll run into. Hi, welcome. Um, all right, I will just repeat the last slide very quickly. Um, uh, where it's going. The um, structure for today is to kind of go through um, four different stages related to fundraising, catching you up here, Alex. Um, and the one to note is that asking is the very last because I actually think it's the least important in terms of making a difference in the amount of money you're able to raise and whether you can find the type of people or the right type of people to ask, whether you can plan in a way that'll allow you to reach your goal, um, whether you tell people who give what you actually did with their money, which is the biggest determiner of whether they give again, um, comes before actually um, asking for a donation. So. Um, I thought we could just take a second to find out who's in the room and what your experiences have been so far, um, positive and negative, positive and or negative. So if you can just say your name, what it is that you're involved in or hoping to raise money for, um, and if you've had a good or bad experience either donating or fundraising for a cause, it can be any cause, it can be like, you know, some friend asked me to donate to their walkathon or whatnot. So um, I'm happy to start. Uh, I'm Kelly, um, recently um, did fundraising professionally for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, but am involved in a number of different projects like the Ada Initiative and um, an open source project called City CRM that I do fundraising for. Um, let's see, uh, good experiences donating. I actually really enjoy donating to Kickstarter campaigns because they do a good job, or the ones I have, reporting back on how the project's going. They're far, far better than most professional organizations are. Um, so that, I think, is a positive experience today. Um, let's see, bad experience fundraising. Oh, asking people who aren't actually interested in the cause. Uh, or um, 
trying to do sort of a double flip. So inviting somebody to come to an event and then springing on them that it's actually a fundraising event, that tends to go pretty poorly. Um, all right, do, do we want to start, let's see, on this side of the room and then go around? Hi, um, my name's Susan. I have a fundraising event that I want to do. It's a And if it's okay to ask about how much are you hoping to raise, is it just to cover the expenses of the project or also a salary? Okay. And how big is your readership? And sorry, I'm just going to ask a bunch of questions of people because hopefully these will be helpful to think through. Oh, good. What did you like about it? Okay. That was my other question. Who are they? And how old are they? And what did you use the money for that you raised? We basically paid off debt and oh. accumulated over the course of orders now. Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, um, arts, arts organizations do that style of fundraising a lot because they tend to be more leveraged. Anyway, Eric? <coughs> Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. I see. And how big is your community? Uh, we 
Okay. Okay. Great. And um, have you had any good experiences donating to organizations? So where they are. Yeah. How much are they hoping to raise? They haven't said. They haven't said. Okay. <laughs> right? Because you're, if, if you're invested in it, you want them to succeed. And you're like, just tell me how much you need. And you're talking about above and beyond the earned income. So, uh, like, as in, you know, like, at, at a minimum, you know, make me able to live on it, but also that I'm able to support the other people that are doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering how that works in terms of like the amount of money that we need to get to the end of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, 
How much are you hoping to raise? Um, or how much would you like to raise, theoretically, from individuals? And how big is your community at this point, like mailing lists and, I don't know. But they're pretty active, right? <laughs> Good point. Yeah. And it's usually solicitations, right? It's usually asking for more money. It's right. Yes. That's a huge problem, right? One of the motivations for asking you these questions, and um, I know I have two more people who I also want to hear from, but is it's always good to stay connected when you're fundraising to the experience of donating. And I encourage anyone who does this professionally or does it on a volunteer basis for long enough to donate to a variety of organizations and just give a small amount because you'll see some of them do very well reporting back what they did with your money and others who just flood you in more asks. And you're like, but don't you realize I just gave to you? Um, anyway, so I, I think it's always good to keep the, the two perspectives. Yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I like um, always trying to, you know, in other contexts when I have workshops like this, I'll ask what's just the best gift that you've given or received, because that's what we're talking about here, right? We're not talking about a transaction, we're talking about sort of a gift exchange. And we've all had really positive experiences probably with getting a particularly meaningful gift or being able to give a particularly meaningful gift. And trying to think through what were the elements that made that more meaningful than others um, is really valuable um, for the people that you're asking to give to your own organization. And then, Mm-hmm. 
The university? Yeah. Okay. Well, the, the OC Foundation. Oh, I see. Got it. Okay. Got it. Well, it sounds like there's enough people, though, where it would be helpful to point out ways um, that corporate giving can be a lot like individual giving. Um, it is definitely more complicated because you have to think more, less about the cause and less about motivating people and more about like what aspect of this would allow you to say to your supervisor that this is a worthwhile thing for your company to spend money on. Um, so I thought to just explicitly say, please speak up about your experiences at any time. Um, when I started learning about fundraising, there was a lot of theory. Um, the only problem is theory becomes outdated and it doesn't work anymore. Um, and so I try to always focus on what do you think um, or what in your experiences has worked. Um, for example, uh, I'm part of a um, group in San Francisco that's kind of like a peer support group. And up until last year, just as an anecdote, they always gave speakers letter openers. I was like, oh my god, you're still giving people letter openers, right? But that's because the mindset of like fundraising resources that you might find online are so entrenched and what's been going on and how they've been doing it for the past 20, 30 years that's really irrelevant, I think, especially when we're talking about um, a younger population and a more technical population. Um, and I already mentioned it before, but um, try to differentiate um, fundraising and donating. A lot of times, um, if you're in conversations with other people on your team, um, they'll often say, well, I'm not a, you know, I don't, I wouldn't be interested in doing this, so this doesn't sound like the right thing to me. Um, and try to, di try to figure out if they're saying they don't want to do that job or they don't think it would be effective um, as a donor. Um, I think it's good to keep those distinctions in mind. So one question that we don't want to take for granted is why fundraise? Uh, especially if we're talking about cause-driven um, organizations, why not just find um, an earned income stream, whether it's to sell shirts or to host um, fee-based workshops? Um, it's inefficient, it's emotionally draining. Um, and I think part of the reason why it's emotionally draining is that there's very high expectations all around. A lot of times people are busy, um, they're non-responsive, you start feeling bad, um, you start thinking that what you're doing is not as important as it is. So what do you think are some of the benefits of fundraising over other funding models? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, those two really, really good points. Right? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, like theaters, for example, often have earned income. 
and then they'll fundraise for an experimental production that they know won't make money or something like that. Um, so here are two of the reasons you already mentioned. Um, one of them, which is the idea of getting stakeholder buy-in. Um, so increasing the number of people who feel committed to a cause is really important, especially in the states they define um, 501c3 um, nonprofits as being formed in the public benefit. So uh, I like how the funding model fits um, that mission in terms of it's actually the public who are ensuring this work can be done. Um, it is also always good to think who are my stakeholders. Um, a, a, an example of um, how you want to try and try to find the right match between where the money is coming from and what your cause is. Um, corporate donations may be a, you know the best source um, for the projects that you're involved in. Um, with uh, digital rights, which is the context I'm coming from, there's a nice um, kind of gradation of organizations that work on a variety of levels, and some of them get primarily um, corporate support, and they can advocate for positions that um, EFF can't or wouldn't want to, and we get primarily individual support because um, our mission was to defend the rights of technology users. So I think those are good examples of how the source of funding should match um, the community that you're trying to help and the, the kind of change you're trying to make. Um, the other reason why it's good to fundraise is because um, people who donate sometimes don't have the time or the interest to actually do the work that you're trying to do. Um, and some of them have already come up, but what would you say are some common motivations for giving? Um, if you can try to sort of distill the um, good experiences you've had, you've had um, giving either to organizations or to individuals. Um, what's that? Tax deduction. Yeah, that's not even on my list. I should put that. I was thinking more like emotionally. <laughs> yeah. See something good happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. <laughs> yes, actually, it's true. Um, some other ones that come up in these contacts, um, and you might want to just take a second to read and think about sort of what have you been motivated to give to um, that falls into that category. Like for me, um, let's see, give back is a huge one. When I was growing up, um, I was fortunate to get uh, several different scholarships for small things, like attending a conference, and that made a huge difference in my intellectual curiosity. So I am a donor who's very motivated by the idea of kind of paying forward. Um, but you can also see that if there's a special interest, like I really like this hobby, I might give to organizations that are trying to um, encourage that hobby. Um, beliefs, experiences, values, recognition, um, expiation. <laughs> if you're in activism organizations, you'll know exactly what I mean. Um, uh, it's like the Paying for your sins, yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> like, oh, we did this really bad thing. Why don't we give to an organization? Um, compelling solution to a problem. So maybe that's one that people are particularly um, motivated by when they talk to you. And you're like, oh, this does seem like a really good solution that he's explaining to me. Um, so they may not previously have had a connection to the cause, but you're able to show them. Um, perceived urgency is another really important one. And um, we'll get to it a little bit later, but. Um, trying to figure out when you're asking somebody, um, conveying the importance of giving now in order to get um, done what you want to get done is, is pretty important. All right. So now into the nitty gritty, we're going to start going through the processes as opposed to, so we just shifted from kind of motivations, feelings, values that might be associated with fundraising and giving. Um, and now we're going to try to break down. Um, I tried to avoid sort of fundraising jargon, but I will mention it 
just in case you're looking at resources later, this is the language that they're probably going to use. So this stage is prospect building. And prospects are people who are likely to give to your cause, project, hackerspace, whatever the case may be. Um, what do you think defines somebody who is likely to give when asked? Uh, let's see if I can put some parameters on that. Um, what qualities would you want to look for? If, say, for example, you looked at, you know, you opened your address book or whatever, and um, whatever equivalent of an address book you have, and you're, you're thinking through, like, would this person give to my organization? What kind of things might tip you off? Yeah. Yeah, familiarity with the cause. That's a great one to start with. Emotional connection, sure. Yes. <laughs> Money. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. That is, in, in many situations, more important than whether or not they strictly have disposable income. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the way I can move to the answers now, I would um, kind of tie that into relationships to the cause, like to, like actual proof of relationships to people involved in the cause or other organizations involved in a similar cause. Um, so they have financial means to give. Um, and it doesn't mean that they have a whole lot. Sometimes if somebody can give $10, that makes a difference and they can speak very passionately about the generosity of their gift um, because it meant that they weren't able to do something that they otherwise um, needed to do. Relationships with you or the cause, um, interest in what you have done or plan to do. Now, uh, again, I'll mention the jargon associated with these. The top is capacity to give. The second is um, linkage is usually the term used. And the third uh, is interest. So that's not too technical of a term. And you want to have all three. A lot of times, uh, if you're, again, dealing with a group of volunteers who are trying to make recommendations of who you should ask, They'll often say, oh, well, I have a really wealthy relative. Um, and you might want to say, is this really wealthy relative philanthropic, to your point? Um, do they have any interest in the cause that we're actually trying to raise money for? Because a lot of times they don't. Um, and it may be very tempting to ask, but you're probably going to get a no. And you want to try to be careful about how many no's you get because of the sort of emotional um, tax uh, of that over the long run. I think for you personally, as well as a lot of times, you want to have volunteers asking for donations too, and you want to try to be careful about um, how many no's they get, especially early on in the process, because that can be very defeating. Um, I'm especially sensitive. A lot of universities have students asking for money, and I always feel a little like, be sure you're giving them good prospects to ask, because it's very um, hard to, to handle that. Um, OK. Yeah, okay, so stepping um, one step forward on this whole um, issue of fundraising being emotionally taxing because it's hard to deal with a lot of people who um, are close to you saying, no, we're not interested in supporting what you want to do. Um, well, I, I'll just toss this question out, and um, if you're sort of struggling for answers, we'll move, we'll move to some of the answers. But um, it's good to have people there to help you through this process. It can be really... Um, painful if you're the only one. And in fact, a lot of times it doesn't work if you're the only one. So what are some roles that you might find helpful um, if you're, say, undertaking like a three to four month fundraising campaign? Who would you want to have by your side? Yep. Yeah. Who else? Yeah. Yep. People like influencers or um, people whose opinions a broad population might trust. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Coordinator. Yeah. So two people don't get the same request for a donation. Yeah. Um, so the, the ways that I describe the role is at least give yourself a campaign leader and maybe that's somebody who can do some of the coordinating. Um, I call them champions, but prospect champions would be somebody who can identify, I know this person in our community and I would be happy to ask them. Um, promotion champions is a little bit like the influencers or somebody who can write about the fact that you're, write about the cause, why it's important, um, the campaign that's going on and why, you know, uh, 
define sort of, if you're the type of person who values this, then you should give now. Um, so people who are good with language, who are good at promoting. Um, and then somebody who has weathered a similar storm before. Um, peer support networks are really, really important to fundraisers, um, simply because it is emotionally draining. And it's nice to have friends to brainstorm with and troubleshoot with along the way. Um, and especially if they've uh, had um, sort of a positive experience with it. Yeah. So usually um, the prospect champions will be people who are either very active volunteers or if you're structured as a traditional nonprofit, your advisory board or board of directors. And there are leaders in the organization or in the community who can look at a list of past donors um, or a list of um, people who fit the criteria of um, having the capacity to give relationships to the organization, interest in the cause, and um, can say, like, I know this person, this person, and this person, and I'm happy to ask them. So you sort of assign. Um, so the prospect champions would be people who um, literally sit down with you and sit down with a list of people that you're going to ask for donations and say, I am happy to um, send emails to these three or four people. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Any other questions? OK, so that was, um, so to wrap that section up, that was all kind of about prospect building. And the kinds of questions that we asked are, um, how do I differentiate a good candidate from a bad candidate in terms of are they more likely to give, are they less likely to give, how can I determine that, what kinds of questions can I ask, or can I ask people who know them better than I do? Um, and then who can I get to help me through this process? Um, who has already donated or is already part of the organization? Um, now we're kind of going to go through the schedule of a campaign, so thinking of it in terms of a discrete um, effort. I like to think of fundraising as something that starts and ends and isn't a perpetual um, aspect of your existence. <laughs> um, and so uh, this um, series of events, uh, I say thanks Ben, um, because Ben Franklin was the one to articulate this long ago, uh, and it still works very effectively today in a lot of big campaigns, especially matching campaigns. You'll see have this exact same structure. So you ask people who you know are going to give first, so these are people who fit all of the criteria that we talked about before of being good prospects. And um, another reason why you want to ask people who you know will give first is because as we mentioned before, if you get a bunch of no's right off the bat, that can be really defeating. Um, but if you get a bunch of people who say, yes, I think this is really important. Um, by the way, can I help you? And is there anything else I can do that you know, gets you started on the right foot? Um, and it's also important because of the example, Eric, that you brought up of the podcasting campaign, um, which seems like it's floundering a little bit. And so if you, if you say, hey, we're starting this campaign, and look, um, the people who are closest to our cause or closest to our organization have, are already behind it. That's a very strong um, sort of front to bring to the broader population, as opposed to saying, oh, 20%. Oh, I wonder if um, you know, maybe people don't have as much confidence in them as they should. Um, then you ask people who are likely to give. So these are people who you say, oh, maybe they don't have enough money. I don't really know their financial situation. Or maybe they're sort of interested in the cause, but we're not quite sure. Um, it's always good to ask them as well. Um, and to ask them second and say, look, these leaders have already given. Um, they've already, um, if they're OK, I should add, having their name being associated with the campaign, very important distinction. For some people, philanthropy is something that's very private, and you want to respect that. And you never, ever, under any circumstance, want to reveal their name publicly if they don't want that. Um, so that's a good question to ask, in addition to would you give. Um, but if they're OK, it can be very motivating. Um, and that's the structure that you see in a lot of matching campaigns. So matching campaigns are the idea that um, if you give you know, on Tuesday, every donation given on Tuesday will be matched by this donor. Um, and usually that donor has sort of a, um, is respected within the community. And people might say, oh gosh, I was so impressed that they um, wanted to um, match this campaign, maybe I'll be motivated to do it as well. And then finally, you ask everybody else, even if you have no idea. Um, so this is, the, this is when you start seeing the tweets and the blog posts. Important distinction for online fundraising. A lot of times, people start with the tweets and blog posts up here. 
Um, and you have no idea if the campaign is going to be successful until you understand whether or not the leaders, like I said, or the people closest to your organization are actually buying into it. Um, and you want to have a strong front by the time it becomes public. Okay. So this is the um, uh, what people often call the uh, campaign pyramid. Here's the pyramid, in case you don't remember what it looks like. Um, but the idea is that you want to figure out how much do I want to raise and um, look at the list of prospects in your community and make a best guess of how much you think they can give. And that's um, based on auxiliary information you may know about them, like their employment situation, um, as well as how much they've given in the past. And usually what happens is there'll be one or two gifts at the highest level, so a smaller amount of gifts at the highest level, and a larger number of gifts at the lower level. And um, it's good to kind of break that down and, and see based on my list of prospects, how much do I think people are actually capable of giving to make up the total that we're hoping to raise? Because if looking at the prospect list, I'm like, well, it doesn't look like we're actually going to get to 150 because I don't know, I don't know enough people who would um, be able to give a total amount adding up to that. You may have to change your goals for the project um, or you'll have to go out and find more prospects. And uh, how you would do that is you'd ask people who have already given or, um, or indicated that they're interested in giving and kind of go through the same process and help them help talk through, well, we're looking for people who are capable of giving, have a relationship with the organization, have um, uh, a, you know, um, interest in the cause. And so you kind of iterate, but with a larger number of volunteers. And this is very common. And a lot of times an organization or people undertaking a fundraising campaign will come up with this initial um, kind of campaign uh, pyramid plan, and then it turns out that two people did not give at the $75,000 level. And you have to kind of figure out, oh gosh, okay, if they didn't give and we anticipated them to give, then we're going to have to find people in one of these lower levels and add more prospects to those categories. And you would go back to the people who have already given, just to repeat myself again, but this is so common um, that it's good to sort of get in the mindset of we are going to have to adjust and how we're going to have to adjust is by um, getting people who have already bought in to help us figure out who else we can ask from their personal and professional networks. Yeah, so, um, no, 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 absolutely. Sorry, I should have added that it, you definitely change this depending on your community. You change all of these variables depending on... <laughs> Um, EFF is a six million dollar organization, so these actually seem kind of low to me because I'm used to working with higher numbers, but um, in other communities they're huge. Um, and in other communities you may, you know, you may, um, a $2,500 gift may be the highest one that you only know one person capable of giving that. Or it may be $50 is the highest one. For schools it may be, you know, $50 is the highest category. Whatever it is, you, you break it down into, um, sort of lower amounts, and you, you can um, guess, uh, you can sort of estimate, I know fewer people who are going to be able to give at the higher amounts, but we might as well try and ask them and see, um, and, and then uh, anticipate more people giving at the lower levels. Um, the second aspect that you want to focus on in this chart is that the number of prospects is much larger than the number of gifts you should actually expect. So if you have a list of four prospects, um, they're not, not all four of them are going to give at the level that you ask them. A, lot of, you know, a couple of them may say no. A couple, one of them may say, yes, I'll give, but I'll give at a lower level. And one of them may give the amount that you asked. But um, again, when thinking through, are we going to be able to raise as much money as we want to be able to raise? Uh, you can't rely on the number of prospects. You have to, sure. I have a question about pledges. Yeah. And I think, like, um, you started on the period of mm -hmm. before, you know, Yeah.
Yeah. Um, and first of all, that you should exercise, feel like, and multiply it. Like, yes. You have to uh, have reach at about 100 times the same thing as one child. Yeah. Um, so, are there you know, common numbers for these sort of things? Like, you have to have the 100 times the same thing as three times the same thing as one action donation? You know, like, yep. Or is that just a bit for, you know, each of your organizations? It's definitely per organization, but I would absolutely say if you plan on doing fundraising over the long haul, you must, must, must know what it is for your cause. Um, because otherwise you won't be able to, you'll um, overestimate how much you're actually going to be able to raise. Um, I will say, so keep track of those numbers, but they will be different and you can't just look at another organization. When it comes to, um, to pledges, uh, so whenever you're dealing with this kind of campaign style, especially people who are giving at the higher level, you are going to be dealing with a, a time difference between when they respond to your email and when they actually make the donation. Generally, though, um, especially if it's something that they consider to be a personally meaningful gift, they'll follow through. But it does require you to send subsequent emails saying, no, really, we actually need it now. Or some may say, can I do it over multiple years? Or can I do it over multiple months? And the key to actually getting that in is to follow up with them. Um, otherwise, yeah, you'll have, you, you'll have three columns, right? You'll have prospects, you'll have um, responded yes to a gift, and then you'll have actually made the donation. And there will be a follow up. But there will be drop off. Yeah. Um, you used a, a phrase when talking about that before about people giving the amount that you would ask. Yes. How important is asking to see what you Very important. We'll get to that in the last stage. Yeah. So on the previous slide, you were saying you know, contact your most likely people first. And, yeah. Um, so on. So in the one you were just showing with the, you know, this one, uh, are you suggesting that you talk to your best donors, uh, your four prospects? Um, so that's a very good question and one that comes up a lot. As a fundraiser, you always kind of have to um, be operating on two different lines. One is the amount that people are giving, but I also try to focus more on um, sort of the generosity, and I don't define generosity by amount. So whether somebody's a good prospect doesn't necessarily correlate with what level they're giving at, um, but whether or not they respond yes enthusiastically to my email. Yep. Well, I'll usually suggest a level, but I will ask the first round of people at all levels. So you said we set this up first, and then. Mm -hmm. it, it occurs to me that, like, I'm in mean, so many businesses. Yeah. But, you know, in my spreadsheet, I'm in five. Yeah. I would start the column, which is, you know, for any given donor, like, probably the other best. The amount of people donate, the probability of the donor. Yes. So there's 75% chance of getting $100,000. Yep. And then you've got another column where you multiply those things. Yes. Sort by that column. Sorry, come again? Well, you've got a lot of categories there. Do you want to present yeah. all these categories to everybody? It seems like no, no, no. Yeah, no, no, no. So I'll just say, I'll, um, like, if I'm asking you for a donation and I think you're capable of giving, um, you know, we'll use $50, I'll say, Alan, would you be interested in giving $50? And you have no idea that I also sent an email to Lance saying, Lance, um, would you consider giving $25? Because I have, based on what I know of your situations and your past giving, determined that these are the amounts that would be personally meaningful to you. Um, and Yep, I mean, you'll see on donation pages a range. Very sophisticated organizations will usually um, sort of, when sending direct mail, um, send options. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, ranges. Whenever I'm doing personal asks, I don't have ranges. I have a specific amount because you want to decrease the number of um, choices that you're trying to get them to answer or make. But uh, if they're just coming to a donate page, then yeah, a couple, um, you know, what you said is a default is important. 
Um, people look for social cues to determine what the organization considers to be a significant gift. Um, and so what, which amounts you choose is important. Um, and it's totally different depending on the organization. Um, uh, as you'll, if you go to the aid initiative site, you'll notice that they tend to have slightly higher um, donations than what you might expect from an organization their size. But it turns out that works really, really well for their community because they tend to be higher income earners and it's a smaller group, um, but that they're giving at higher levels. Uh, other organizations like, I think EFF has a pretty, pretty broad range. Um, I think we go from like 25 to 2,500, which is pretty rare. But smaller organizations may have 10 to um, 100 or something like that as their range. So probably the wording of your solicitation, you would say, you know, it's great, you can make $50, but if you can, you can make less. Nope. Don't let them off the hook. <laughs> They'll let you know. They'll respond and say, you know, and, and usually it's odd. The, the responses not to be, the responses that I've gotten are usually not offended. They usually say, like, um, you know, I can't really give that much right now. Would it be okay if I give $25 as opposed to 50 And the response should always be, we'll get into this a little later, but the response should always be, absolutely. You never want to tell somebody that their gift doesn't matter, no matter how much it is that they're giving. Um, another column that I add to the spreadsheet is the give um, amount to ask amount, because that's also going to be important if you're tracking progress over time. Because if gifts are coming in lower than the number that you ask people, you have to adjust your goal mid-campaign. Does that sort of? Yeah. There's no harm that I've seen to overshooting. If you grossly overshoot and you ask somebody who should be asked fifty dollars to give a million dollars, like that's a little absurd. But yes. If somebody writes back and says, well, I can't give 50, I can give 25, don't be like, what about 35? Just say yes and <laughs> move on. Um, OK, so uh, again, we sort of talked through this. Um, but the idea that if you want to get you know, 10 donations of people who you believe to be, even at the highest level of good, 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 great prospects, you're still, you should still plan on asking more than that. So um, this is just uh, an example of a calendar um, of how sort of I like to operate campaigns and um, you know, decide on what you're raising money for. So what's the project? How much is it going to cost? It's good to have that in the back of your mind. But you are going to have to temper that based on what the responses are once you start asking people whether they want to support it financially. Um, identify high level prospects. We already did that. Um, plan for promoting. How are you going to let them know? How are you going to let a wider population know this all happens very, very, very early on. Um, and then start asking the higher level prospects. Notice I haven't said tell anybody publicly. We're only planning to promote. We haven't actually started promoting. Um, get the responses. If their responses are, no, I would never support that project in a million years, maybe you want to start rethinking whether or not it is really going to fulfill the mission in the way that you had initially thought it would. Um, and you can refine the case, because it hasn't gone public yet, which is really great. Um, um, design the front end campaign. By front end campaign, I mean ask, answering questions like, what's our donate form going to look like um, for people who don't previously have a relationship with the organization? Recruit people who can help you um, and then ask um, mid to low level prospects. And by then, you want to have raised 50 to 75% of your goal. If you haven't, go back and iterate because people want to contribute to things that are successful and not ask themselves, well, if I give, are they actually going to reach their goal? Um, I always feel really bad when organizations start out and say, we want to raise $100,000. Um, here's our progress bar, and it's totally empty. And you're like, oh. Um, people who are farther from your organization, farther from your cause, don't really know what you're doing, aren't going to be motivated to jump on the bandwagon unless it looks like other people have already. Um, don't forget to celebrate a su successful conclusion um, to the campaign. Again, the reason why I'm talking in these kind of discrete forms is because um, fundraising should be discrete. It shouldn't be something that is just a perpetual condition that you live in. Um, and then post-campaign cleanup, like following up with people who pledged but haven't given yet. Be sure to plan that, uh, plan time to actually do that, because otherwise you won't get the gifts. OK. Um, moving on to the second stage here. Uh, again, um, we haven't even gotten to actually breaking down what it looks like to ask somebody to donate. Because it turns out that reporting on what you did with their money is more important in the long term 
organizations have seen over time that a very small percentage of people who give once give twice. And that's very often because they never received a thank you, they never heard what actually was accomplished um, with their donation, and so you end up having to constantly try to find new prospects. And that's very hard, especially if you're dealing with a small community. And so I find that reporting over the long term is more important than asking people for a donation the first time because you'll be able to keep people. And it's amazing to look at charts over time and think about, oh my gosh, if we had retained all of the people or even a fraction of the people who have lapsed or who have disappeared, um, we would be in a much different financial situation. So that's why we're going to talk about um, how to tell people what you did with their money for a second. And um, what this little hierarchy is um, describes what most communities probably look like, most donor communities probably look like. Um, so at the transactional level, you'll have people, to use EFF's example, who really like our t-shirts and hats. And they are just going to become members because they want to get our t-shirts and hats and they don't really mind paying a little extra that goes to the cause. Um, but they're very exchange-based and they want to know what gift they're going to get in response. Usually, um, and it totally depends on what your cause looks like, what your organization and community look like, but generally it has a similar pyramid shape where people will come, uh, there'll be a wide community of people at the exchange or transaction level who come for a little while, disappear pretty quickly. From that group, you want to be able to find and bring closer to your organization or to your cause people who want to participate in your mission. So these are people who want to volunteer, people who um, kind of care more about the cause than whether or not they can just identify it with a hat or a shirt. Um, people who want to share with their friends why this is important. Um, and then at the ownership level, you have people who want to take a leadership role in your organization. They really want to volunteer a tremendous amount of time, or be a volunteer organizer, or be on your advisory board, um, or be a board of director. And those are the, organization, those are the people that keep the organization um, sort of stable and growing and moving over time. Um, and the challenge for people who are fundraising or for people who are running an organization is to be able to kind of capture the people who are interested in participating and becoming owners and move them up that um, called chain of engagement. So this is the goals that we're operating under here. Um, so what kinds of questions, to go back to the question answer format, might you ask before donating? If you were to just receive a request it can either be in your hypothetical example from a friend or um, an organization you've never heard about in the mail. What might you want to know about them before you send them some money? Is it tax deductible? Versus overhead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else? Yes. Do you have a record of success? That's a great point. Although I think Kickstarter is changing a little bit of our risk um, associated with that. Yeah, that's a huge thing. Um, I, I, I've done a lot of research for my and I'm like, are you all lost to the point that you live in your shelf streets? Yeah, that's huge. Um, and it's like, or if a digital organization is doing, you know, uh, and probably were, is it part of the problem or that sort of thing? How I feel about that depends on how they do it. Um, another example of that on a more general level is a lot of times I may believe in your cause, but I don't think that the strategy you're taking to affect that change is actually the right one. But that's a great example. Are you able to find those answers, or do you usually have to talk to somebody? Um, sometimes I can find the answers, but usually only need to do something terrible and only need to do something terrible. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
Any other questions that you might want to know? What size t-shirts do you have? <laughs> what size shirts do you have? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I always do that, and if they don't have to my size, I yeah. then keep them off their name. So if I get those emails, it's always going to be good. Yep. That's true. We try to be very conscious about that at EFF. I think it also has to do with sort of what culture is at the organization and whether they're like how they're defining their community in their minds. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can also well sometimes it's harder to call and ask, but you can you know that. Because you're like, where is somebody going from? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If it's a US based organization, you can always look at their 990, which gives you a sense of, I mean, a very high level sense, but you can at least see like how much are the top pe people being paid. And yeah, I don't know about the sharing, information sharing too. Yes. A lot of times I don't know if we're giving the one organization. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. A lot of the stuff. Hired fundraisers, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and because a lot of the, the organizations that do fundraising for organizations uh, for what we run in Bell and we will also do Bell and do you, so there's a lot of just sharing. Yeah. Money's coming from where the rest yeah. of the money is coming from. Um, who's on the board, stuff like that. Well, it's not like, oh, you know, it's a, you know, we're supporting women in care, but it turns out that this program is being supported by a whole bunch of companies that actually don't want to be Or not supported by it, it's like a collaboration between companies. Mm -hmm. And then I'll be like, I don't really believe you, or, uh, Some other ones, um, if you don't, you know, if you're uh, not somebody who's more directly involved in the um, cause, who are you? What do you want? Um, sometimes people, we're getting a little bit into the language of actually asking for donations, but sometimes if you're kind of shy, um, you might hide it or might bury, you know, what you actually want them to do, which is to give money. Um, how will a, a donation make my life better? How will it make uh, a difference for the cause? Um, why do you matter? Why is your cause important? Why do I have to give now? Why are you trying to undertake this project now? Is there some kind of urgency? Um, what did you do with my last gift? Um, when organizations just overwhelm you with more solicitations and there's no communication in between that of what they actually did with the money that... What's that? But there's mailing address labels. <laughs> You should have done that before asking for a second donation. No, nope. An ask should just be an ask. Nothing else. And if you haven't already told them what they did with the last gift, it's too late. <laughs> um, were you grateful? So somebody mentioned earlier that they received a thank you note. That kind of stuff matters. Whether they showed appreciation, we are dealing with gifts um, and not just straight exchanges. You can't thank them for you know thank you for the support. 
Um, sure. Yeah, you can do that. Usually, um, I will do that to sort of just acknowledge the fact that they have a history with the with the organization. Um, so you're not just some unknown, you know, person or just a name that was in your mail merge. Um, can you prove you had an impact? Um, a lot of nonprofits struggle with that. So they can, a lot of times they'll say, but our cause is really important, our cause is really important, but they don't really have numbers to support it. There's sort of a lack of sophistication at the moment with trying to measure that kind of thing. Okay, so um, how do you know if people don't tell you um, whether or not over time you're doing the things necessary to keep your community um, of donors happy? Uh, these are the things that, that we look at and that a lot of nonprofits look at. How many people are new? How many are lapsing? So how many from one year or one 12-month period to the next did not give again? Um, that's a huge indicator. And if you can email them and say, like, hey, we just wanted to know, um, you know why you decided to stop giving or if you're interested in giving again, and you'll, you'll get really good answers. And maybe they'll say, I never heard what you did with my last gift. Or I heard and I didn't like it, which we occasionally get. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about having a, like a web page Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in campaign design it is a good thing, especially if you are, um, yeah, if you're close to your goal, it can be very, very effective, um, but only if you're very close to your goal. Actually, the organization that publishes a lot of data on this is Wikimedia, um, and they have great, great, great um, numbers on this sort of thing, but I think it was like right before the end, it does make a difference. Um, people want to feel like they're participating in something, and so it's good to reflect back how big the community of people is. Um, sometimes we do that at EFF, we'll have real-time statistics, not with names or anything like that. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about the stuff like, um, and it's, it's sort of, I'm sorry, I keep kind of saying what we're doing. Sure. Yeah. But I think it's Yes. Humble Bundle. Where, I don't know if people are familiar with it. Yeah. Humble Bundle is um, the, they are doing su such a great job at EFF. We basically just we're one of the benefiting charities, so we have a close relationship with them. But we think what they did with their payment form is genius. Um, we also stole the um, top donors, so they have again because people are looking for social cues. So if you're a Linux user and you see that the average donation of Linux users is much higher than you were planning on giving, you're like, oh. Um, and they also had top donors, which was voluntary. So if you fell into that category, a box would pop up and say, please give us your handle or name that you want to appear um, on the list. Don't have to do it. But um, that's nice, too, because like the beating the average thing, it pulls the um, level of donations up. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah, they do that, too. It's true. Yeah, Humble Bundle is a perfect example of um, campaign form design. The other thing I'll caution you, though, is that it works really well with them because it's always moving. And if you're doing a very, very small campaign, um, or if you have a very small community, sometimes it may not have the same, um, it may not kind of get that same level of gamification. Um, at EFF, we don't do this all the time. We do it for two, we've done it for two campaigns, one at the end of the year, when we already know that there's going to get a lot of views and a lot of traction on the site. 
Um, and then we recently did one for podcasting, which we also knew was going to get a lot of attention. So um, again, if you're going to visually represent what's going on um, because of the sort of motivations or the, the kind of like, to your point, like psychological motivations around fundraising or around people who are giving, um, who are, again, distance, uh, a little distanced from your cause, because that's who we're talking about when we're talking about people who come straight to your donate form as opposed to being personally asked. Um, they're going to look for things like how many other people are already involved in this, does it look like the campaign's going well, um, stuff like that. So to get back to metrics um, over time in your community, uh, within the category of people who give from year to year, we also look at if they increased their gift, decreased it, or um, gave the same amount. Um, if you really want to get um, these numbers for your community, here's how we calculate it. You can come get these afterwards. Um, all right, so now we're on to actually asking for money. Phew, so much work, right? Um, two points I just wanted to make before we get into some of the more technical details. If you haven't given, you don't have a right to ask. I feel very strongly about this. Um, if you are involved in an organization or if you're involved in a cause and um, say, for example, you're on the board, and you say, oh, sure, I have some extra time. I can help build the prospect list. Um, and then you go out to your friends on your prospect list or your professional um, acquaintances who you think are good, you know, interested in the cause. Um, and you say, would you be willing to give $100? And you haven't given. I don't think you have a right to ask that question. Simply because you should show by example that you think what the organization is doing is, is important. And it doesn't. What's that? What do you, well, okay, so let's say it's an organization that's dealing with, you know, people with poverty in a certain, you know, demographic group, mm -hmm. and you're one of those people. Like, yeah, yeah like give whatever you can. Give five cents. Give something. We talk a lot about what's personally meaningful to you. Um, and for, for some people, that can be five cents. Um, but it can still be a meaningful gift. Um, I think that's just very important because of um, the, going back to the whole why fundraise. Um, we're talking about stakeholders. Like on the one hand, yeah, we're talking about gaining the financial resources in order to do a project, but we're also talking about whether or not somebody feels committed to a cause, or somebody feels committed to sort of fulfilling a project. Um, and uh, I think it makes that um, exchange much more authentic. Um, and then oftentimes uh, you want the person to ask who would be the hardest to say no, um, simply because they have sort of a very, uh, there's a lot of trust in that relationship or they really believe that what they're doing is important. Um, and so you can, um, so this, this comes up a lot, especially now that fundraising is becoming very professionalized. A lot of times organizations want the um, fundraising staff to ask, but that can be far less effective than actually having the ED ask or the person who has that that personal relationship um, with the donors to ask. Okay, what kinds of things might you want to include? And I will also, before we get into to answering this question, mention that um, when we're talking about asking for money these days, and probably with most of the communities that we're involved in, we're talking about email. Now we're talking about email to people who are super busy. So you can't write that long, multi-page direct mail that somebody is going to sit in their chair at night and read page by page. We're talking about probably three or four lines. So what would you want to get in there? Now let's break that down for a second. What kinds of things would you say in order to? OK, great. Yeah, what it's going to be used for. Yes, excellent point. Wonderful point. In order to accomplish that particular goal? Sure. Yeah. Yes. The amount. Yay! <laughs> what else? Anything else? Thanking them. Not yet, right? They haven't given. But you can thank them right away. Yes! <laughs> How to actually give. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Right? Because earlier people were talking about wanting to know if you have a track record of success. Um, so here are a couple things. I think you mentioned all of them. Um, if you're 
a volunteer asking, you might also want to say why this mission matters to you personally and why you think it matters. Again, the point you made in the back was perfect. Why are you asking me? Because you don't want to ask people without having a reason to believe that they're actually interested in this cause. Um, I feel like that's what results in people having a lot of bad experiences being asked to give. Um, what, you, what you plan to do with the money. Um, showing that you've, uh, you've been successful doing projects like that in the past. Um, what impact will it have for the cause? Uh, this is an important distinction a lot of times. Organizations mistake um, benefit to them as an organization, but what's actually going on is the donor is interested in the cause and just sees you as one of the possible paths to do that. So that gets to your point, Ashish, about why our way, um, because we think we can have a better impact on the um, work, that, you know, the, the kind of uh, change that we're trying to make if there's other organizations doing it. Um, and then the specific amount at the bottom. Okay, so let's talk about the kind of responses you're likely to get. No response. This is the most likely outcome of sending people who you have spent so much time trying to determine whether or not they're close to your organization and who probably volunteer time and who you think have the capacity to give and who've shown that they're interested and have a personal relationship with you is no response. Get used to it. And um, the other thing I try to do is I try to um, plan with volunteers who are participating in this process to um, write not the first email, but write like three emails because you will have to send follow-up emails. Um, can I donate less than you asked? We talked about this a little before, but the response to that is absolutely. Yes, we're so appreciative. Um, can I donate later in the year? Sure. If because of how your organization is structured now, you need the money in, um, say, May, but this particular donor wants to make a gift, um, wants to break their gift up because of their personal financial situation over multiple months, hopefully you'll have enough other donors who can give right away that, that you can allow them to do that. If there's a way to let the donor give at the time of year that works for them, let them do that. For a lot of people, that's December 31st at 11.59 p.m., and that's cool. Um, how do I donate, right? Did you include uh, a link to your donate form? Can my donation be anonymous? Please, yes. Is it better to have a box to say, um, you know, make my name anonymous rather than having a box that says, uh, you know, you make uh, That's a good question. When I'm dealing with personal emails, so the people who are higher on the level are like the, the people who are better prospects, um, once they say, yes, I'm interested in giving, in my thank you letter, I'll probably say, would you be okay with public recognition? You know, do you want to volunteer for the rest of the campaign? Yeah, wait till after. Because you want people to sort of focus on actually making the choice to give or not, and not 50 other choices that come later. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, going back to the idea that uh, the first time you send an email, most people will not respond. Um, these are some of the things that we track or that I would add to that spreadsheet we were talking about earlier before undertaking a campaign. So these are my columns. Um, uh, response, no, or amount. Um, this is really helpful if you're dealing with large numbers of people that you're sending personal emails to because then you can just say, oh, who hasn't responded? Okay, these people have, have not responded. And you want to be sure to say, to record if somebody has written back and say, said, no, I can't give it this time because you don't want to accidentally send them a follow-up email um, saying, you know, I didn't hear from you. Would you be interested in giving? They're like, I did. And I just, it was really hard for me to tell you no and I don't want to have to tell you again. Um, and then the actual to ask so you can track. Um, you know, whether or not your campaign is coming in at the level that you expected it to. Um, the other thing to note here, besides the general information, the amount that you're going to ask them, um, if there are volunteers also participating in asking people they know who it's assigned to, um, the date of the first time you sent an email, second email, um, the date that the payment was actually made, again, going back to the fact that people may pledge in response to your email but not actually um, donate the money. Okay. Does anyone have questions about that before we get into a, a little bit more technical of the slide? Yeah. Sure. So that's if you ask somebody to give $50 and they say, um, I can't give $50 at this time, would $25 be okay? So in the initial um, planning stage of the campaign, we had um, estimated our goal based on that person giving $50. And so it's good to keep track of as the campaign moves forward whether or not 
the actual amounts that people are giving is coming in lower because you're going to have to change either your expectations or go through another iteration of trying to find more prospects to compensate for the, the decrease in gifts. Okay. Um, yeah, second email. Um, so is that the follow up once they say yes? <coughs> Good question. Second email is for people who did not respond to the first one. Yeah. So you should have sent people um, a thank you right away if they did respond, and usually you don't have to track that progress. Um, you can if you want to just be extra sure that they're being thanked, which is good. Um, but the second is for people who didn't respond to the first. You mentioned the article with CCRS. Mm -hmm. Do you use CCRS to use the spreadsheet? What kind of recommend people do? Next slide. Um, oh, so. How long? <laughs> Um, depends on your community. Uh, these days, uh, I usually don't wait longer than a couple days. But if your community is um, sort of like used to a different pace, yeah, you might want to wait a little longer or be um, slower. Yeah. Yeah, a week or two. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so how to keep track of this stuff. Um, spreadsheets were totally, totally fine. I think especially for um, just tracking this kind of information, if you plan on doing multiple campaigns or you want to um, have sort of more of a uh, more structure to your organization, and it's not just sort of a one-off one effort, I think it is good to invest in a CRM or a customer relations manager. And these are um, platforms that uh, record like donations, uh, event participation. Sometimes they can help with volunteer management. They're really super robust. Um, and once you kind of go, you can really easily go down a rabbit hole of thinking about all of the things that you want to track, and it can be really overwhelming, and um, you can become unhappy if you think too hard about that. Um, City CRM is the one that I'm a part of, um, and the one that I left EFF to do more with. Um, Blackbaud is a really horrible proprietary company. I am happy to say that um, on recorded video. They have soaked up all of the competition and charged outrageous amounts of money, so I would not um, encourage you to use their products. But a lot of nonprofits think that that's the only solution. Salsa Labs is a smaller company that is a little cheaper, um, still proprietary, um, but they're there if you're interested in CRMs. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the pluses and minuses of these various ways of actually processing donations, because we're mostly talking about online donations, right? Um, crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter, plus and minus. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yep. As opposed to. Yes. Yeah. That's a great solution to this problem. Or like Indiegogo also tries to get around what happens if the campaign fails. You can still do something with them. Um, I think you can choose at the beginning whether or not to have them. Um, they take a higher amount. I think they take 9% as opposed to 7%, right? If you want to take the money without reaching the goal, which is pretty expensive. The other minus of these, um, as you're talking about, is they don't provide a lot of support for the campaign planning process. Um, and so if you have the infrastructure or you plan on investing in infrastructure over time, they look to organizations like EFF as an expensive payment processor. But for people who don't have that organizational structure, it's essential because they don't have CRMs, they don't have, um, you know, even like Square, PayPal, Stripe, and stuff like that. So they they provide a really really valuable role that you pay for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Some of the payment processors have that same, same problem like Stripe, I think you were talking about earlier. Um, the nice thing about Stripe, if you are based in the US, is they don't require PCI compliance, um, which is super nice. What's that? Neither does PayPal, yeah. Um, Square, if you have a lot of in-person events, people can just charge the card in person. Um, any other questions about this? I'm going to move quickly through this, and we can talk about it more, because I do want to get to troubleshooting in the last few minutes. Uh, 
Ah, that's a good point. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Deal with that. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So um, I would recommend having more than one. And generally, especially if you're dealing with a tech community, um, people also have strong feelings about PayPal because of their not only financial sense, like, well, there's the issue of them trying to detect fraud, but also the financial censorship. Um, which people object to legitimately. And so if you are going to offer PayPal, I would say it's also a good idea to have like a second option. If you have, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, usually it's not important that they donate by Friday. But if it's an in-person event that they want to participate in, then they do have to respond. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's more like, you know, hey, we're holding an event on Friday. Yeah. yeah. Or like, you know, yeah. You, you turn the ask into an event. And this works a lot with volunteers. So the nobody's responding to emails. Um, with people who are helping in the fundraising process, like you want to help build lists or write sort of promotional material, um, uh, I started to find that um, don't ask them specific questions about those roles in, in email. Just get them to respond using email to an in-person call, well, not an in-person call, to call in or to have an event and then go over what you want them to do in their volunteer activity that way. Yeah, invite them to coffee. No. Calendar it, yes. People are so busy. They're used to calendaring things. <laughs> no. With, yeah, with people that, so there are several ways you can calendar things. You can, for the, the volunteers or the people who you need to hire touch with, I would say get it on their calendar. Um, after that, you can have a programmatic deadline or a fundraising deadline. Um, those are usually a little harder to engineer. That's the purpose behind matching campaigns. Whenever you see a matching campaign, it's an artificial deadline, but nobody pays attention unless there's a deadline. Um, and so the campaign really, really, truly will end because your donation will not be matched and people like their donations to trigger other actions. Um, and so that's, that's the kind of motivation behind matching campaigns. It's an artificial deadline, but it is a deadline. Um, uh, programmatic deadlines, an example of that is uh, we need to invest in this thing by this date and the project won't get off the ground unless we hear from you in order to invest that money. Um, that's another way you can try to create a sense of urgency. So, um, uh, going, I should have, I guess, put the nobody donates. Uh, adjust your goals, find more prospects. We talked about that a lot. Um, oh, yeah, you can have somebody else write the email. Maybe they're just not. I, I think somebody mentioned that. Add deadlines, write shorter emails. Um, let's see what the middle ones. You're afraid to look at your inbox. Um, get someone to look at it with you. That's why it's good to have like moral support. Uh, through the fundraising process. Um, sometimes people have anxiety about asking people they know. Yeah. 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 Yes, it's true. Yeah. yeah, it's true. People, it's if you're um, sort of sometimes you're going out on a limb asking somebody to make a commitment to something that you don't know if they're really truly already predisposed to be committed to, and so um, some people. Yeah. Um, so you start hating yourself and your project. Um, the best way to solve this problem is go out and talk to people who have given and ask them why they've given. Donors are amazing. I think one of the richest things about fundraising is simply hearing why the cause matters to people who are very um, happy, delighted, pleased, grateful to be able to give to you to do your work. Um, it's a very emotionally sustaining experience. Um, the other one I want to mention is somebody says they're offended. Sure, somebody is, you know, anybody can be offended, but I do want to point out that if you hide the purpose of an event or an email, that can be very damaging to a relationship. If you're inviting people to an event and you're going to be asking them to give or you're going to be talking about a donation, make it very, very, very clear what that purpose of the event is. You don't ever want somebody to show up at an event and then all of a sudden be like, I didn't realize that you're going to be asking me for money. Um, that happens occasionally and it's not good. Um, if you, um, if somebody says all you do is ask for money, stop for a while. Yeah. Uh, I know it's really kind of one problem with the story about the company. Yeah. So there's an off topic, there's also called like a bomb that says like the city of Boston now needs to get into the new center and also the new Boston world. And they did a two phase thing where in the first phase, people were handled by the bomb, and by the way, so it's really, really happy. 
That's perfect. That's a perfect example of how to distinguish that, differentiate that. Um, I know we're out of time, and I do want to say I have sort of, if you want to stick around, bonus slides exactly on that topic. Um, but I do want to mention that thanking people is the most important process. I didn't talk about it that much because it's really easy, and all you have to do is say thank you, but do it. I don't think so. I think it's more whether or not people have a relationship to your work um, that is. Tax deduction is important, but I think people are more interested in sort of seeing good work being done. Like the example that comes to mind is there's a bookstore in Palo Alto, California um, called Kepler's. And they were a for-profit and they had a very important presence in the community and they closed and the community got together and gave them the money they needed to reopen. Um, so I think that there's um, sort of what we're seeing is breaking down of a lot of the traditional um, kind of distinctions between for-profit, non-profit. You have a lot of um, companies that are crossing those boundaries more. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I think it matters a little less these days. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you need it, say yes. If you don't, or if it'll take too much time, say no. Um, occasionally, you know, uh, arts organizations, for example, will be given, um, so I use them a lot because I did a lot of fundraising with arts organizations, um, especially if you're a museum, a lot of people will say, oh, I have this art piece, do you want it? And in order to assess it, in order to pay the costs of st storing it, it's not worth it a lot of times. It's just simply, it's too much um, burden on the organization and say no. Um, the other thing along the lines of saying no, I didn't even go over this, but sometimes people want to give you money that is um, not in your benefit. And so don't do it. If they have too many demands, if they say, sure, I'll give it to you, but I want to report every single week and I want to see all of your books or whatever the case may be, it's not worth it. Say no. Or earmarked, yes, exactly. Like, I'll give it to you if you start this project that I know isn't actually directly related to your mission. It's like, no, go find an organization that does that. Um, they should be. Yeah, they'll be. Probably my talk, I think that's, I think that's how it's going. Yeah. Um, if people want to stick around a little longer, um, the um, distinction that issues made between two different kinds of events, one in which you just inform people about the work you're doing versus one that's specifically oriented towards fundraising. I thought I would, um, and this was me late at night being like, I should probably also just mention these in case you come across it. Because if you're doing research later related to fundraising, you'll hear these being mentioned. And unlike the other slides, I didn't actually define them. I just gave you the jargon. Um, but the idea is what we talked about. So identify is the process we talked about of looking for people who have capacity, interest, relationship to the organization. Once they give, you want to qualify them. So qualify means um, determining whether or not they want to stay at the level of being a transactional donor, whether they want to participate in your organization or take an ownership role. So qualify means, is this somebody who wants to have a, a large, you know, more complex relationship with the organization over time? Cultivation is an event exactly like the one you described, where people simply tell you um, at the event or show you, which is even better, the impact that the organization is making for the um, community or cause. Um, solicit, asking for donations. Steward, thanking people for donations. Perpetually steward is when I add. Um, that's if it's former board members, people who have given significantly to the organization in the past, but maybe their financial situation has changed, but they still deserve, deserve sort of the utmost respect, and it's important to keep them, keep them on the list. Time for lunch.
thanks guys for coming. Um, if you have questions along the way, email me. I love to brainstorming with people how to solve problems related to this kind of stuff because you'll run into it. <laughs>